Welcome to Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we are joined by Kathy Kelly. Kathy Kelly is the co-coordinator of Voices for Creative Nonviolence. You could find their work at www.vcnv.org, which is a campaign to end U.S. military and economic warfare. Kathy has been one of the leading voices for nonviolence and anti-war activist for many, many years, a uh, personal hero of mine and someone who... Uh, while I was being trained in the Marine Corps and being sent overseas, was actually in Baghdad in 2003 with many other peace activists uh, during the shock and awe bombing and has really put her life on the line uh, over the years. So I can't tell you how much I respect you, uh, Kathy, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you, Vincent Serge. I'm, I'm so pleased that the center exists. I think that Michigan City is fortunate, but also you're setting a great example for other places. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. We hope to get it back up and rolling as soon as possible. Let me let me just jump in by asking you, um, well, by just thanking you for coming on the program and by asking you what you make of Trump's recent decision and even Mayor Lightfoot's decision to welcome mm. Uh, the Department mm-hmm. of Homeland Security officers to come to the city of Chicago, a city you've lived in and worked in and have deep connections in for a long time. Okay, good. So what do you, what do you, how do you process the, um, the recent decision by Trump and, and the DHS? Well, it seems to me that it's, possible that he's eyeing the elections and thinking, well, I need to create a distraction. You're like, look, look over there. But I think it's also in keeping with a, 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 a short-sighted and, and really very cruel and wrong-headed approach to the terrible violence that um, several neighborhoods in Chicago have been enduring for many years. And, and I do hold um, Mayor Lightfoot responsible now too, because she says she welcomes this move. I mean, when you think about it, there's an awful lot of money that's being invested in transporting and housing and arming 150 um, Department of Homeland Security officials to focus on a neighborhood that's been so neglected, wherein people have suffered and suffered badly because they don't have jobs and they don't have decent housing, and they often don't have decent food or access to getting food. And, and so the idea that the only way to solve this problem is to put more boots on the ground, more guns, more militarization, um, what has that gotten us in the past? I mean, the, the schools in that area are um, heavily militarized, both with police officers inside the schools, but also when monies have been spent, it's often been to create uh, military academies within public schools in the south and the east sides of the uh, city. So I, it, it makes me both sad and angry. Um, the neglect of the neighborhoods wherein the violence has been the greatest has been going on for a very long time. And the racial disparities in terms of housing and education and um, programs for health care have, have been horrible. So what would we expect other than frustration and misery and violence? I mean, this goes back to Rahm Emanuel. This goes way before him, but I'm thinking of, you know, Rahm Emanuel's term as mayor of Chicago. You're talking about closing over 50 public schools uh, multiple uh, mental health facilities, uh, protecting the police when they when they were uh, caught murdering innocent people or abusing or torturing people. Of course, then the information came out about Homan Square, a sort of secret black site that the U- that the um, Chicago Police Department had been using uh, to take various prisoners there to question them, to torture them, to keep them captive without. Uh, legal representation. I mean, these things have been going on in in the city for a long time. Well, the, certainly the information is there, and the the um, reasons to uh, tell p- 
policing structures. Look, you've had your day in the sun. What you do is so wrong and it doesn't work. Uh, that's also there. And so um, I was hoping that there would be different leadership coming forth uh, after Rahm Emanuel. But I, I think that's not forthcoming from the people who are in high places in Chicago. But we do find that the Black Lives Matter movement and others who have gone to the streets and said we're not going to accept this any longer has been strong and durable. I've been surprised at the duration of the protests, um, the diversity of the protests. Have they come to a shock to you? I mean, that they've been taking place now for going on two months? Well, I'm... I'm surprised, actually, that um, we've seen such durability. Uh, you know, the Occupy movement was something that it, it certainly succeeded in putting all around the world that crucial logo, 99 and 1, um, the 1% exercising so much control over economies and, and vast resources. Um, but it was hard to sustain the Occupy movement. I think this movement will possibly be more sustainable, and I surely admire the youth leadership that's present, and and also the diversity in um, not only um, participation, but also um, the kinds of uh, tactics that are used. Uh, and and um, again, I, I I look to your center in Michigan City and think, you know, this idea of using community as a tactic and sharing resources and caring about other people's conditions and, and what they face and, and um, not wanting to continue the terrible inequities that have been so exposed through the COVID-19 pandemic. I think that's a, maybe I shouldn't use the word tactic, but I think it's a, it's a means and the means you use determines the end you get. So when I see those kinds of means being used, I, I, I can't help but feel encouraged. What would your advice be? So there's different levels to the violence in Chicago. We, you've been in so many places that have experienced horrific violence. You've been a part of programs and projects that, you know, attempt their best to alleviate some of that violence, the pain, the suffering, and trauma that comes as a result of that violence. What do you think could be done in Chicago in the interim. So we know that the long-term solution is to provide more and more social programs, uh, educational programs, after-school programs, and so forth um, to the parts of the city that have been neglected for so long while the 1% has gotten away with murder. But at the same time, in the interim, as you know, you know, just this shooting that took place yesterday in Chicago was shot 15 people. 10 of them were women. One of the women shot was 67 years old outside of a funeral that they were attending for someone else who was shot. I mean, the kind of trauma that that, the kind of pain and suffering that that creates in the short term is also something that we have to deal with. I mean, what is your, I know I'm not asking you to have the solutions to all of these problems, but I think you're someone who people could look to for advice in these kinds of contexts. What what would your advice be to the people who are living through uh, that kind of pain and suffering now? You know, knowing that mm. we're, we're going to fight our best for the programs that will get at the root cause, but in the interim, we have a lot of lives that have been shattered and destroyed because of this violence. You know, it, it doesn't ease the, the pain and the agony, the loss, the bereavement. Uh, but I, I do trust the process that we hear when Black Lives Matter activists say, say their names. Uh, keep telling the stories. Keep saying the names of the people whose lives have been lost and keep insisting those lives are valuable. The memories, the history, the family connections, uh, the friendships of each person whose life has been lost, who's been taken from us, tell those stories, say those names. Uh, and and I think that that appeals to the humanity of people in a way that's especially, especially needed. Um, and that may then help accrue the resources that are needed for those longer-term solutions. But 
um, I think to to tell the stories of the people who are bereaved and also the people whose lives have been snuffed out is very, very important. Um, and then also, you know, building community between people and between neighborhoods is very, very important. I had an experience teaching in an alternative high school um, where in, it was such a small school. I mean, no class was larger than 10 students and there were just maybe 50 students in the whole school coming from two different um, north side, I'm going to say the word gangs, although I didn't see these kids mm-hmm. as gangsters. Um, but they, every year, three young people were dead by the end of the year. And it was because of retaliations for uh, violations of codes or rules with regard to the drug trade. It was because of Um, people having weapons they never should have touched, but I I think it was essentially because of poverty. Um, And and actually, some parallels can be drawn, and there's some further understanding I think we can get when we look at war zones um, beyond, because, you know, if you look at a place like Afghanistan today, I, I can remember being with a veteran for peace member, Mike Ferner, and um, former military colonel Anne Wright, uh, in in a vehicle driving alongside the edge of probably the most squalid refugee camp any one of us had ever seen. This was a place where people who'd been displaced by fighting, by war, by running out of water and was watching their flocks thirst to death. You know, they had nowhere to go, so they 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 crammed into a place where there weren't any buildings, where they were living in um, mud, literally mud huts. And in the in the winter season, with the rain and the snow, uh, they were kind of slogging in mud. Um, it was like a quagmire. They were burning plastic in order to get fuel. Everyone was hungry. It was just a miserable, wretched place that no one would ever want to be. And right across the street. And uh, uh, protected by a, a, a very well constructed um, stone wall and ex- m- taking up uh, a section of cobble so huge that you could drive for 20 minutes and you were still driving along the perimeter of this United States military base, right across from the refugee camp. And every day, multiple times throughout the day, trucks would turn to the right <laughs> into the military base and bring water and bring fuel and bring food and bring supplies and never would trucks approach to the left and take any care or concern for the refugees who were made refugees because of that war, which was prolonged by the United States military presence. So I I think that same dynamic goes on in our neighborhoods. You know, the monies go into the jails, into the, federal prison in Chicago, into the policing structures, into um, the ways of maintaining the city's wealth and lavish resources for the wealthy people, and then there's nothing left over, nor any concern really, as the decades pile up for the neighborhoods where people have always been kept out of having any access to the resources. Now, you've been invited to Afghanistan by the Afghan Peace Volunteers on several different occasions. When, when was the first time that, you've been, that you went to Afghanistan, and when, how often have you been there lately? When was the last time that, you, that you've been to mm. Afghanistan? Well, you know, we had started to realize that our group was pretty out of touch with 21st century militarism. We didn't understand much about drones, and yet we I, I remember Jeremy Scahill, who's a very excellent journalist and had been part of us, our group when we were in Iraq before the 2003 Shaka bombing. He was in our kitchen, and he was pounding the table, and he said, when are you going to get in touch with 21st century military? And I didn't know what he was talking about, so we started to research and learn more about drone Warfare about these unmanned aerial aerial vehicles that were operated by people inside of 
bases in the United States that were carrying 500-pound bombs, and once they were launched, could go uh, with their camera footage guiding them to places that supposedly were valid targets and bomb the daylights out of people uh, in other places like Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we started to go over to Pakistan and get to know human rights groups and visited with people who lived in areas that had been hit hard with drone warfare and people had been displaced. And then when we were there, we realized, wow, you know, we could get for a hundred dollars a flight and go over to Afghanistan. And we had um, been very impressed by an Italian group that was running a hospital in Afghanistan called the Italian Surgical Center for Victims of War, sorry, the Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War. And we'd known the work that they had done in Iraq. So we asked if we could come and visit. And they said, yes, yes, do come. We'll house you uh, in two of our places in Afghanistan. So we went for two weeks and uh, were in the Panjshir Valley and then in Kabul. And while there, um, we got in touch with the Afghan peace volunteers, whom we first learned of because we were doing a fast to close Guantanamo, and we found out that these kids in a pup tent on a mountainside in the middle of the winter were doing the fast with us. So we asked if we could come and visit, and they were very excited. And so the next time a group of us went in October of 2009, um, I'm sorry, 2010, to visit the Afghan peace volunteers. And I guess... From that time till now, I've I've gone back and forth, normally at least four times a year, although this year is certainly not because of the lockdown and the pandemic. And we've probably sent upwards of, um, oh, uh, 40, 40 delegations over to Afghanistan. Wow. What has... What has changed over the years, and what is the situation like now? What do Americans... As you know, Kathy, outside of people like Jeremy Scahill, I mean, you could almost name them on a couple of hands, you know, may, somewhat or either mainstream journalists who do follow these things, um, following what U.S. empire, U.S. militarism is doing abroad. What do you think Americans need to know at this moment right now in history um, about what's happening in Afghanistan and what needs to be done? You know, I think it's important for U.S. people to know the consequences of the bombings. And and when you read those stories in detail, it's horrific. Um, there's a um, reporter for the New York Times named Jeffrey Stern, and he decided to kind of follow the trajectory, if you will, of a paveway bomb that had been manufactured in a factory in Arizona and then he went to the place where the bomb hit in a very small village in a remote area of Yemen. And it, the village is called Arhad. And the villagers had been doing what everybody all around the world ought to be doing in light of climactic catastrophe. They pulled their resources. They were just about out of water and they hired a rig and collectively, they all started hoping that this rig would hit water because they were desperate. And then one night, finally, after lots of mishaps and a lot of disappointments, they hit water and people were dancing. They were singing. They were exhilarated. They stayed up till the middle of the night. And then just as people started to head for their homes, along came a bomb that when it was cut from the kind of hosed or tube connection that connected it to uh, a jet plane, then started to hurtle toward the ground and it contained two tons of explosives. And when the bomb hit, those explosives traveled it, it makes big steel shards at eight times the speed of sound and it disemboweled people, ripped arms and legs off of torsos, decapitated people, tremendous bloodshed. Those who survived had to be taken long distances to get to a hospital, and surgeons were in a panic trying to find materials to stitch people back together again. The following morning, when about 100 people, including curious children, had gathered at the site where the bomb hit to try to figure out what happened, 
A new wave of planes came, again using United States intelligence and laser-guided missiles and attacked that group of people and killed 42 people. I mean, these kinds of experiences are nightmares, and they happen again and again and again with extremely expensive, scientifically researched and engineered weapon systems. And if there aren't wars, Raytheon and Boeing and Lockheed Martin and General Dynamic don't have customers to buy all these things. That's right. And I think we need, we need those stories. What gives you, just to give folks an idea, you, people who might not know, you were in Iraq not only during the shock and awe campaign, but you were actually there prior. Um, if I'm, if I remember the, some of your stories correctly, you were bringing, defying U.S. economic sanctions uh, by bringing medicine to children in Iraq, families in Iraq. Um, and then you eventually lived in Baghdad during the 2003 shock and awe bombing. Can you talk a little bit about those experiences? Of course, they're, I'm sure, somewhat similar to what you were just saying about uh, Afghanistan, but also, you know, what gives you the strength, what gives you the courage um, to be able to do these kinds of acts? Whereas I think some people who might be listening to this, you know, they're, which they're probably right to think of you as a superhero. Um, but, you know, they, I think there's people listening to this who are probably saying to themselves, wow, how, what gives her, what gives Kathy the strength and, and courage to be able to do these types of things? Well, I should qualify Vince and say that if there were mistakes to be made, I think our group was making them. I sometimes think I could kind of uh, make a list of the mistakes we made and I could do it geographically and chronologically <laughs> and topically. But if we waited till we were perfect, we'd wait a very, very long time. And, and something that some of us knew came from experience in 1991 when we had joined um, an international peace encampment in Iraq. It was almost a preposterous idea. We were out in the middle of the desert. We called ourselves the Gulf Peace Team, and we were 88 people from 17 different countries. And our idea was to place ourselves in the middle, interpose ourselves between the warring parties. Well, as it turned out, um, in a way, we, we, we were kind of in the way because the United States was experimenting with the idea of a pincer move where they would um, kind of form pincers and uh, retreating Iraqi troops would then be sort of caught by the U.S. military. Well, the Iraqis saw this and they said, you know, get, get us out of here. So um, they wanted us out of that encampment. We really didn't have any choice. We would have been left to die in the desert. We didn't have an independent access waiver. So anyway, we were in Baghdad, and that's when we began to see what the effect was when the United States, during that 1991 desert storm bombing, bombed every single electrical facility all across Iraq. You bomb out the electrical facilities in a relatively modern country, People can no longer purify their water. Then you've got economic sanctions imposed on the country and people can't get spare parts. They can't get supplies. They can't get medicines. They can't get all the things that you need to sustain a country. And we realized we, in a sense, knew too much to turn our heads and say, well, you know, nothing we can do about it. And so everything we did was too little and too late. But finally, by 1995, when these religious sisters, and they, um, I mean, I'm not a large person, but these, these women made me look big. They were tiny little women. They were elderly and frail. They kept going back to Iraq and going to the hospitals and coming back to the United States and saying, something's got to be done. The United Nations is saying that 500,000 children under age five have died as a direct result of these economic sanctions. And so finally thinking, you know, that, that's an incredible number, 500,000. And these kids can't control Saddam Hussein. Uh, they're totally innocent. So we thought, well, we can't be a humanitarian relief organization, but we do know something about civil disobedience. So we decided to break the sanctions. And 
we broke them as often as we could. I guess I went over there 27 times. And we had mailbags that we'd take from the U.S. Postal Service. And we would fill those up because they were sturdy with um, vitamins, antibiotics, any kind of children's medicines we could lay our hands on. And the idea was, was to break the law, to break those economic sanctions. And we, we ended up um, being able to send 70 delegations in open and public defiance of the sanctions. But I think more importantly, we were so ragtag. Eventually, other groups with more heft started saying, well, if they can do that, we will too. And so Veterans for Peace and Pax Christi and Fellowship of Reconciliation um, many different city groups formed up and went over and everybody who returned hit the ground running and saying, this is what we've seen and heard. Um, I remember one British nurse came back after sitting in a, a children's pediatrics ward and he had shook his head and he said, I think I understand. It's a death row for infants, isn't it? A death row for infants. And that's what was going on for 13 years, this terrible punishment of children, of elderly people, of sick people, of poor people. And, and a whole generation of Iraqis still today will say the worst time during that whole period of war for them was the sanctions because it hollowed out their society. Uh, people were so traumatized. And then the United States hit them with the 2003 shock and awe bombing. So one thing I remember is that it was typical. I don't quite understand why, but when you'd go into a hospital, especially in the southern cities like Nasiriya or 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 Basra, women completely clad in their black abayas would pull you into the bed with them. They sat cross-legged on the beds all day long trying to fan their children and flick the flies away and um, you know they they couldn't feed the children but they'd pull me into the bed with them and I'd be sitting on the bed um, feeling as though these women wanted me to feel like I was part of their family well not one of those women could afford my despair and and their voices they could have spoken for themselves if there would have been a way to get to for them to be heard, but they they couldn't speak to people in the United States, and we could. So we we kept on trying to, in a sense, um, give a voice to voices that should have been able to speak for themselves, and say, "We mean you no harm. Stop killing our children." That's uh, it's it's heavy work. How do you, how do you how do you keep yourself on the level dealing with this kind of work. I know so many people, as I'm sure you do, Kathy, who I met through the anti-war movement, um, who for one reason or another become burnt out, um, deal with too many atrocities, drive themselves to the brink of madness because of these things. I mean, and as you also know of all the issues that happen or that are happening around the globe, uh, the issue of U.S. empire and U.S. militarism is one that continues to sort of march on. It's often happening in the shadows, though not for the people it's impacting directly, uh, or the even the military members or family members of military folks here in the U.S. Um, but this is something that's not on the nightly news every night, and yet it is so horrific. And so many of the people we've met along the way... Um, you know, have had a hard time keeping up with it, uh, let alone remaining active. What 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 allows you to do that? Not allows you, but where do you find the strength or the courage to do that? And I know the story you just mentioned, um, I'm assuming has part to do with that, you know, giving you the inspiration to continue to do this. But those are heavy stories, 27 times to Iraq, uh, many times back and forth to Afghanistan. You've been to Gaza, um, I'm not sure where else you've been. I'm sure other places, but the, it's a heavy, um, a heavy toll on on one. Mm -hmm. 
Oh gosh, I sure wish that I had the answer for how to cope with trauma caused by war. Um, I think about Jacob George so often. He was a Marine who, um, he did all the right things to try to cope with trauma. He went back to Afghanistan and he met with the Afghan Peace Volunteers. He really loved those kids and they were very, very fond of him. He um, made a commitment to ride till the end. He would ride his bicycle until the war ended. He put his banjo on his back and he rode all over the South and he sang and he'd like throw his head back and sing his heart out. And and these were often very raw songs, reflective of terrible violence as well. But then um, when he learned that the United States was going to have a new surge of troops into Afghanistan, um, I don't know if that was the main reason why he decided to take his life, but um, he became one of the 22 people every day who are veterans of United States combat and who, who commit suicide. So the, the, the trauma is extreme and um, debilitating. I, I have such gratitude in my heart for children in war zones. Um, they, they literally pull you along with them, literally. I, I remember being in Gaza and there was this terrible, terrible stretch of bombing. It was called um, Operation Cast Lead. And, and I mean, I think back and I, I can hardly imagine it myself and I was there, but once every 11 minutes, a bomb exploded for three hours from it would go from nine until one in the morning and then start again at three in the morning until six. And uh, once every 11 minutes, either a 500 pound bomb would be dropped from an F-35 or um, an Apache helicopter would fire a Hellfire missile. And, you know, I know nothing about ballistics and missiles, but um, eventually I could distinguish between the sounds of those blasts. Why? Because the children in the family where I stayed taught me. And yet when there was a ceasefire, those kids couldn't wait. They were just gleaming. They couldn't wait to get a tarp and go around the neighborhood and they were pulling me with them to pick up um, pieces of lumber and um, scrub brush so they could bring it back to their family so that their mother could start a fire and cook food. I mean, they just knew that their parents were so, so worried and they wanted to help their parents. And I I remember the same thing in Iraq, little kids just going out to collect bricks to help their parents rebuild. So the energy of children, the beauty and the innocence of children, I think can do a great deal to pull people through these horrible experiences of destruction. The kids sometimes don't quite get the scope of it. Now, then I think of children I've seen whose bodies are torn apart while they suffer in hospital beds and, you know, doctors have to tell them, you know, you not only lost your limb or limbs, you, you're the only surviving member of your family. There's just no way to um, say anything about those children other than that we're sorry. We are so very sorry. But nevertheless, I think um, the desire for a a new generation to have another chance to try to get it right is is something that um, can help people through the traumas of war. I mean, if I could just tell you quickly, I I, I, I knew a family in Basra. We called their street Missile Street because the United States had hit it with a bomb that, that killed one boy, Haider, and the surviving son, Mustafa, said that um, when asked what was your brother's last word, he said, his brother said, Mama. And, and so I knew that mother and child and their family quite well had stayed with them often. But now, little Mustafa is big Mustafa. And the last time he called me, he, he wanted to know, could, could I give him some comments on Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe because he's working on a degree in English. <laughs> well, that's, that's quite a switch from earlier days. But also he wanted me to know that he's gone to every demonstration in Basra 
um, that's calling for a, a, an end to the United States presence there. Let me change gears a little bit, Kathy, because this is something else that's on people's minds right now, especially with the different actions the Trump administration has taken uh, with regard to nuclear weapons. Can you talk to us about the need to abolish nuclear weapons, how important this is? I actually just received an email um, from Professor Peter Kuznick earlier today. He He's uh, having a series of webinars with different activists and, and people scientists around the globe who are calling for, you know, a new set of treaties to honor existing treaties uh, around, uh, you know, demobilizing those those nuclear weapons. Um, what Talk to us about the importance of doing so uh, and some of the experiences. I know you've been talking about this issue, fighting this issue um, for many decades now. Mm, well, it's just... Uh, so ridiculous for the United States to be walking away from treaties, for the United States to decide that it's now going to put new uh, warheads on the uh, nuclear submarines that already have warheads. They're looking for ones that could enable usage of smaller tactical nuclear bombs, and this means that uh, countries which also have nuclear weapons from India, Pakistan, uh other countries around the world trying to get weapons are all going to say, okay, full steam ahead, this, this, this nuclear arms race can continue. It's extremely, extremely dangerous. I have friends who uh, went into the Kings Bay Nuclear Naval Station in southern Georgia, and they did a symbolic act of disarmament. And one of them, a very, very close friend of mine, Steve Kelly, he's no relation, but he's now beginning his third year in the Glynn County Detention Center in southern Georgia. Um, he's got a warrant out for his arrest, so they're not able to release him in this, or they, they choose not to release him. Uh, but this case has been going on. They're, they still await sentencing. They t- took their action uh, April 4th on, um, in, in remembrance of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who had been assassinated uh, that day. And um, they took that action in 2018, and and now they still are awaiting sentencing, but they were convicted. Um, You know, the the presence of nuclear weapons in our submarines, mounted on airplanes, under our ground, is, I think, um, constantly, whether the weapons are used or not, a diversion of greatly needed resources that always ought to have been spent on something else that is good for humanity. I I remember back in 1988, um, a number of us planted corn on top of a nuclear missile silo site in a field in Missouri. And and while I was um, kneeling in the field, handcuffed and awaiting transport to a a county jail, uh, the soldier who was guarding me um, he he had a, a weapon named at me, and I um, never really turned around to look at him, but I, after a while, started to tell him about the kids that I mentioned earlier in this interview in my neighborhood who were part of these various gangs, and that I was hoping that our action of disarmament here might ultimately help children in his life and children in the Soviet Union. And then I asked him, do you think the corn will grow? You know, we planted corn on this nuclear weapon site. And he said, I don't know, ma'am, but I sure hope so. And then I asked him <laughs> if he'd like to say a prayer with me. And he said, yes. Yeah. So I quick said a memorized prayer, the prayer of St. Francis. And then at the end of that, he said, amen. And then he asked me, ma'am, would you like a drink of water? And I said, oh, oh, yeah, thank you, please. And he asked me to tip my head back, and he he poured water down my throat. And, you know, I don't know whether, because I didn't look, but I don't know whether he had been holding the gun and put the gun down. But I do know he used both hands to squeeze the water from his canteen down my throat. And I always think that soldier's choice that day to care more about water giving water than about protecting the weapon was actually 
right uh, in line with what we need today to say we care more about children in Flint, Michigan getting water than we care about keeping these weapons. We care more about children in Yemen getting water than we care about sending weapons to Saudi Arabia. That we care more about future generations having water than we care about maintaining these omnicidal weapons. So I'm always grateful to that soldier. It makes me think as well how we could, it makes me think about the approach of reaching out to people within these violent institutions. You know, I was in a violent institution as a veteran in the Marine Corps. Uh, We have police officers today uh, who are participating in all sorts of actions. As you know, uh, Kathy, there's plenty of people in that group of people from the Department of Homeland Security who probably will regret whatever they're about to do or whatever they participate in. Um, Your story reminds me that probably one of the better ways Uh, And this isn't an excuse for people who commit crimes or people who, uh, crimes against humanity, that is, um, or people who abuse their position of power. It's just to say that if we're interested in bringing some of those people to our side, it would seem to me that playing to their humanity uh, would be a better way of doing so. Do you agree with that or do you think that's naive? You know, I completely agree with that. I, I had should have brainstormed the other morning um, by myself um, some ideas about what might possibly be done in terms of the 150 officers coming to Chicago. And I was thinking about a priest on Chicago's south side who um, a couple of years ago, he, he's right in the area that's so hard hit with the um, violence and the shootings, the constant shootings. And so he um, had asked a carpenter to put together really heavy wooden crosses. Um, they, they were quite heavy, like 20, 30 pounds. And each one bore a picture of someone who had been killed and the name. And then there was a procession down this very wealthy, magnificent mile, they sometimes call it, uh, Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago on a um, cold January winter Sunday. And I thought, I wish we could get those crosses again and maybe set them up in the, in Chicago's federal building plaza with a white chair next to each one and at least 150 of them set up 150 with a white chair and invite each of these arriving officers to just sit in the chair for five minutes and think about the life that was lost represented by that monument. Or perhaps there would be a way to um, invite these officers to be part of a walk, a silent, somber, funerary walk between Chicago City Hall and the Cook County Jail, you know, recognizing the, uh, the stigma and the family breakup and the unemployment caused through this terrible mass incarceration and we sometimes say rail to jail syndrome in Chicago. Uh, somehow ask those uh, newly uh, arriving people to reflect on the scene into which they've arrived and, and, you know, lay the weapons aside, lay the protective gear aside, be vulnerable enough to, to somehow try to connect with communities that have been so neglected in Chicago and so this, it doesn't help any of us to demonize um, these people whom we can't see through their masks and their shields and their, their camo. Um, but if there were a way to presume that if they knew the stories of the people that um, have perhaps been characterized to them as, as these demons that have to be rounded up and have to be taken out, if they knew the stories, they'd have a different perspective. And, and I think probably, you know, quite a good number of people working in the armed forces in many different capacities in the United States do know those stories because they grew up in those stories. But there haven't been other ways of work and meaningful um, uh, purpose made available to people. Right, right. No, I've been thinking, I mean, I've been doing a lot of personal reflection uh, 
I think as all of us have for the last several months, but particularly since the protests and even more specifically over the last few days, you know, we had friends in the chop Chaz zone in, in Seattle who were telling us about the situation up there. Of course it ended tragically. You know, we had Mm -hmm. uh, two young black men who were actually boys. They were teenagers who were shot and killed by security forces there. Well, one of them was shot and killed. Another one was injured, you know, thinking about, um, the general state of politics, the atmosphere in the air here in the United States. I mean, I often sort of try and warn my friends on the left, but also friends I have who aren't involved with uh, political organizing, activism and the like, that, you know, hoping for or or trying to push things in a more violent Uh, confrontational direction is not going to have the response that people think it's going to have. Now, I do believe that people have a right to defend themselves, but I think, you know, even there you're talking about things that turn into retaliation. You're talking about a whole number of, of things that will turn out bad for everyone involved. Um, what, and we can kind of leave it with this, at least here today, we can we can end the conversation with this. But I, I'm wondering what your advice is to a whole new generation of uh, young people who are in the streets fighting back. Of course, I think none of us want to sound like we know it all because nobody knows it all. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's no, you know, I think so. There's got to be some kind of a balance between older elders within the movement providing advice, and then elders in the movement also being wise enough to step aside and allow people to kind of have their space. But what I have Mm -hmm. found somewhat troubling is that I don't think enough elders within the movement have been able to, I think, speak openly and honestly about how bad things could get if things turn uh, particularly violent. And we see some of the signs of that. You know, I have friends on the left who before this never talked about violence, but who now all of a sudden are telling me that they're buying weapons and learning how to use their, their AR 15s and so on. And you know, I, these things are all extremely concerning to me. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and, and any advice you might have for people who are rightfully so, by the way, I don't want to downplay this. I understand why people are angry. I understand Mm -hmm. being exposed to that level of violence, what it'll do to you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, but I do think it's important also for people to, to hear another side of that so we don't fall into this sort of glorification of militarism, this glorification of, of even what would maybe be called uh, revolutionary violence. I don't know how you feel mm-hmm. about that, but anyway, I would, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are. You know, I had a chance, um, gosh, it was in 2016, to go to Minneapolis after the execution of a young man named Jamar Clark. And um, Minneapolis activists hosted a, a, a retreat. It was at least three days of retreat that people joined in. Um, I'm part of something called the Catholic Worker Movement, and this was the, the, the annual Faith and Resistance Retreat. And, and, and the Catholic workers really try to um, uh, roll up their sleeves and radically share resources of housing and and food, but also then be try to keep salaries beneath the taxable income and and then be available to be part of nonviolent resistance efforts. So this faith and resistance retreat was facilitated entirely by Black Lives Matter activists, and they they asked us, you know, we want you to lean out so others can lean in. And uh, we're going to plan this action and ask you to trust us. And so on the opening day of the um, baseball game in Minneapolis for the Twins in front of their stadium where they were going to play, we did an action of civil disobedience and blocked the, um, I I was part of 27 people blocking a metropolitan bus that was heading toward the stadium. And, and the idea was to say, look, there's something far more important than this game going on and that's the ongoing execution of people of color in this city and the police violence and so we were arrested and it was a long process of 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 trial but what i what i learned from the people in that coordination was how carefully and um skillfully 
they wanted to apply their uh, resistance work so that the issues would go in front of the courts and they'd get some acquittals. And uh, in fact, my co-defendant was acquitted. I was found guilty. Um, But also that never in the course of the court proceeding was the name of that young man, Jamar Clark, mentioned. Never. Uh, those questions weren't being asked. So I think um, my hope is that young people will keep demanding that questions be asked about the violence that's been wreaked upon their neighborhoods, the violence that has been part and parcel of how uh, young people of color have been treated and, and, and make people sensitive to that and to do that by aligning themselves with the people who are the most vulnerable um, and 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 you know we we find people who are most vulnerable I believe in the poorest areas of our cities and then to find kindred spirits to really find community to find people that you can um, trust will work with you to bring about what you want to see. But then the byline that I would add is that the means you use determines the end you get. If you decide to use violent means and um, adapt to uh, maiming or blinding or torturing or killing another person, those means aren't just going to evaporate. They're going to stay with you and with your movement, and they they will have ongoing consequences. So I I think that's a sobering um, question to look at. You know, if you once you use those means and 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 accept that you can um, eliminate another person, or maim, or torture, or blind, or or kill, or traumatize another person. Uh, you, you, you cross a line, basically. Uh, you train yourself uh, to have another understanding about the value of the human life. And that's a very, very big step to take. Uh, and then with whom do you wish to align yourself? And if you you know, find that you're building communities that are more and more tolerant of um, destruction and killing and possible death, then um, be ready for that community to maintain that tolerance for a long time. Thank you uh, very much. I, I, yeah, I think those are those are great words, and they make me think a lot. Um, how are you? I should end by this. Actually, um, we, at least for people who are listening, so they can know as well. How are you holding up? I asked you this at the beginning, but we had to cut off because of a, a technical difficulty. How are you uh, holding up during the pandemic? Well, thank you. You know, I like others, and I suppose. Um, not on a continuum of progress and uh, towards some uh, distant, different future. I think I find uh, some days are you know three steps forward, two steps back, and I I'll find myself feeling a sort of a malaise or um, a, a kind of a loneliness at times. But on the whole, I think I've been quite fortunate. I um, you know, all of my needs are met, and then some. Our group uh, holds a play reading <laughs> every Monday evening, which we do via Zoom, and that keeps us together with people from various parts of the country, even. And if you have any plays you'd want to suggest to us, we'll be very open. Um, but <laughs> I think um, it's, it's an important time to use some of the extra time uh, in ways that are are profitable. I've been trying to teach myself the language of Dari, which is spoken in Afghanistan and been just very, very grateful for a chance to read several novels that I might not have otherwise read, which all of which were um, brilliant and quite helpful. And, um, you know, it's, it's good to connect with people um, to make that phone call to somebody that you think maybe hasn't heard from you for a while or maybe hasn't heard from anybody for a while. All of those things are important. We we have a beautiful world. It's certainly worth preserving. Um, but we must listen to the voices of those who are least served um, by the unfair systems that we have today. 
Thank you so much, Vince, for calling me and for giving me all of this time. You could send me a bill for therapy, I'm sure. No, it's no. A, a real, it's been great to, to be with you and to hear from you a bit, too. Yeah, it's been it's been too long since I've heard your voice, and I always it was always nice to see you at events. And I hope to I look forward to a day when we can see each other in the streets again. And I look forward to giving you a big old hug. So it's good good to hear from you, Kathy. Oh, <laughs> uh, I can just about feel it. And, and thank you, Sergio, as well. He he doesn't have a mic, but he's giving you a thumbs up. <laughs> all right good okay well, both of you take good care of yourselves all right yeah same to you kathy and i'll make sure to stay in touch more than i have but i appreciate Great. it all right thank you all Bye right now. take care you've been listening to park media i'm your host today vince emanuele and we'll talk to you soon hey thank you for watching and listening If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you can become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.